resigning to help my partner blow the whistle on a catalogue of crimes committed by the British spies in the 1990s. And under UK law, thank you, under UK law, uh, a nasty piece of law called the Official Secrets Act, we faced automatic arrest and um, judgment and conviction and going to prison purely for trying to report the crimes of the spies and lived in exile and hiding for three years before David Shaler and I returned from France to face the music. And he went to prison twice in that process. I and many of our friends were arrested and it was a very high price to pay. Things have taken a slightly darker turn now. Post 9-11, as you all know, the gloves came off from the intelligence agencies, not least in America, but unfortunately closely followed by their willing enablers, the British intelligence agencies too. So ever since then, with the cascade of horrors that have emerged, from torture programs to kidnapping, extraordinary rendition, to illegal wars, to people being put on kill lists, even American citizens, and signed off by their own president, and to the fact that people, whole, cit uh, whole villages, whole um, communities are being eradicated with anonymous, automised drone strikes across the Central Asia and the Middle East. Things have never looked darker. Well, I thought that a few years ago. Now, of course, <laughs> we have the whole ramping up of tension with Russia, the whole Russiagate issue, a new era of fake news, which is being used to censor us, we the people on the internet, not censor the fake news that is daily uh, paraded across our mainstream media, and where the threat of nuclear war, nuclear annihilation, has never been as strong or as dangerous as it has been since I was growing up in the 1980s, where, you know, at school we were taught to duck and cover. In Britain, we were taught and shown lots of TV and dramas and everything of the real threat of nuclear annihilation. I remember growing up terrified under this. Well, that in Britain, we had a strange obsession with the rabies as well, for some reason, but it might cross the channel like dangerous EU ideas. <laughs> But joking aside, I don't think the world has been on the brink in quite this way since probably the Cuban Missile Crisis. It is terrifying to me, it's terrifying to many of us, and we're trying to work our way around it, trying to work out what we can do to counter it. When the US attacked Afghanistan in October of 2001, then Vice President Dick Cheney predicted that the US war on Afghanistan, quote, may never end but that it would become, again, quote, a permanent part of the way we live. Cheney also predicted that the United States would take the war to between 40 and 50 in other countries. And again, this was back in October of 2001. So endless war is no accident. Fast forward to today, in announcing a surge of United States troops to the 17-year-old war on the Afghan people, President Trump declared that our continuing commitment to ensuring the uninterrupted flow of US weapons and trained killers to Afghanistan would be, quote, the healing balm that would bring America together, end quote. Uh, but I'm, I'm still having some travel plans uh, that are, are causing problems uh, that has not changed in this administration. Uh, and I'm not sure if the possibility were there uh, that I would accept a change under this administration. Whistleblowers and, and journalists are, are two sides of the same coin. Uh, one of us is, is rarely able to do their best work without the other. And this is never more important, excuse me, I have a little bit of a cough. This is never more important than when traditional oversight really breaks down, uh, when the things that we rely on, when the normal operation of our civil institutions starts to crack uh, and experience great stress. Where do we truly draw our civic power from? Now, most people would say the vote, and this is how it should be. Uh, theoretically, uh, the government has no power but that which we provide. 
But when it comes to voting, uh, and this, this idea uh, that the government draws its, con- its, draws its legitimacy from the consent of the governed, well, consent is only meaningful if it's informed. But what does it do for us as a public? Uh, if we go to the voting booths, uh, and we don't actually know what it is that we're voting on, what does it mean if we are lied to as the public or deceived even for the best of intentions uh, by office holders, uh, by uh, ordinary working line uh, government employees. When each statement, each claim, each lie over time builds up to reduce the impact of our vote. Well, this, ladies and gentlemen, is where journalists come in. Because even if you have the best sourcing in the world, if you can't get the truth heard, the truth loses its impact, it loses its force, it loses its power to persuade because that comes from a common understanding. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I was thrilled to hear that the journalists we're talking about tonight, Seymour Hirsch, was once described by the Bush administration's uh, a man from the advisory board uh, at the Department of Defense called Richard Pearl as the closest thing American journalism has to a terrorist. (laughs) Now, with that coming from the Bush administration, I would consider that to be a high compliment. (laughs) This man was responding to an organization made by by, uh, Wolf Blitzer, I believe, I I could have this wrong. Uh, But it was during a a, a, a news discussion about was sort of Saddam Hussein actually hiding weapons of mass destruction. And of course, this gentleman was saying, yes, of course, it was true. He had all of these missiles. He had all this sarin and anthrax and, you know, WMDs. Uh, And if we didn't do something, if we didn't go in there and disarm him, you know, it was going to be a terrible outcome. Now, when he was confronted, with a report from that morning by Seymour Hirsch that said, well, Mr. Pearl, uh, Seymour Hirsch is reporting that you have a conflict of interest, uh, apparently, uh, and that you are part of a corporation that stands profit from this war. Uh, What would you say to that? And that's when Seymour Hirsch became the closest thing American journalism had to a terrorist. The astonishing truth about government scandals is how many people can know about them before we, the people, the public, finally catch wind of it. Cy is a reporter who understands that government officials, in the words of I.F. Stone, all lie and nothing they say is to be believed. Every time they describe their own policy or where it's heading or what it's like, or what are the considerations that bear on it, uh, they're never telling the whole truth. They're always being misleading, depending on to, in what direction depends on the audience that they are trying to mislead. Uh, the person who broke the me lie story, and that is presented, uh, having made apparently a very definite editorial judgment uh, in describing that episode, uh, not to call it murder. Uh, although, in fact, I, I have to give them credit, uh, I think after a controversy about that question, uh, the word murder was used eventually, but of course what he was exposing was murder, just as your other uh, winner tonight, a previous winner who was not able to get her prior award because she was in prison for having told the truth, Chelsea Manning, my hero, uh, very much so. Uh, is, uh, the chief is revealing, of course, was uh, put out by Julian Assange and WikiLeaks with the headline, uh, collateral murder instead of collateral damage. Uh, and what she saw on the film and what she was describing was murder. In April 2006, he revealed from mass- a lot of interviews that the George W. Bush administration, in particular Vice President Richard Cheney, had ordered plans for attacks, widespread attacks on Iran, and specifically for 
prepare nuclear attacks on Iran. And that the Trump chiefs were opposed to this and criticized it, but of course they can only go so far uh, under civilian authority where he revealed that as did Philip Turali, former CIA official. Uh, both revealed this planning. And it is my belief, based on following that very closely, and it's been a very important aspect of my life ever since, in the 11 years since, to avert any such attack. I believe that it was Cy Hersh's and Phil Tirolli's reporting at that time that led George W. Bush to reject the strong urging of Richard Cheney uh, to use nuclear weapons against Iran, which would have been catastrophic for the world. And I believe that uh, he's never gotten the credit that he deserves for that or the enthusiasm. I, I, I think we all owe him a very great debt. And the State Department, as you all know, the reduction under the uh, Trump administration is to be 29 percent. 29 percent of the budget of the State Department is being taken away. Uh, one could argue, okay, we do have a lot of programs, a lot of programs that we have uh, that uh, for our ability to work in other cultures. And some people say, well, that's all, that's intelligence. We are gathering intelligence about other places. Well, I think that kind of intelligence is worthy. I think we need to know a lot about other cultures, don't you? Yeah. We need to know about them. We need to know enough about them to know that we shouldn't be killing them. Yeah. That we should be we should be friends with people. We should know enough about them to appreciate all of the culture that they bring to us. And every one of those cultures that we're going after right now have a much longer history by how many thousands of years than our pitiful little 200 and, well, how old are we, 40? 240 years. I mean, we are such babes in the woods on this thing, and yet we're going after huge, long, I mean, Iraq, Iran, thousands and thousands of years old that they are. We look at, at Korea, Korea that was only divided 70 years ago, after World War II. We divided it. We and the Russians divided that. And now we vilified part of that peninsula, the northern part of that peninsula, beyond belief. We vilified the North Koreans until most Americans, not you all, I don't think, but most Americans think that North Koreans are just horrible, terrible people. And so in 2002, when a senior officer in the CIA's counterterrorism center asked me if I wanted to be trained in torture, I said, no. I said, it's torture. No, it's not. It's enhanced interrogation techniques. I said, that's a torture program. I speak frequently at colleges and universities around the country, and I like to ask students there real life questions. Now, as background, there is no ethics training at the CIA. No. Nothing. No. Nothing. The problem with that, besides the obvious, <laughs> is what a CIA psychiatrist once told me. He said that the CIA actively seeks to hire people who have sociopathic tendencies. <laughs> Not sociopaths, but people with sociopathic tendencies. Sociopaths have no conscience. And with no conscience, you can easily pass a polygraph exam because you don't react to anything. But sociopaths are impossible to control. People who have sociopathic tendencies do have a conscience, but they're willing to operate in moral, legal, and ethical gray areas. The problem is, there's no real way to weed out the sociopaths. And if you can't weed out the sociopaths, you can't weed out the psychopaths. <laughs> and the psychopaths, because they're psychopaths, rise to the leadership positions. Well, let me, let me just say that when we established the Sam Adams Award for Integrity and Intelligence, we couldn't do otherwise because Colleen Rowley had just uh, blown the whistle on all the terrible things, the mistakes and worse that the FBI had done before 9-11. Matter of fact, if they hadn't done those things, it would have been a cinch to stop 9-11. And then we had NSA people come out of the woodwork who said there was evidence in NSA's database that showed exactly what was going to happen before 9-11, but that database was only, that only cost uh, $30 million. Uh, they discarded that and went with uh, one that cost $3 
billion dollars with a B as in boy, and that wasn't working, and so we never got that information. So these are the consequential things. Now today, uh, the 22nd of September, is exactly 50 years and one month since uh, General Abrams, who was General Westmoreland's deputy in Saigon, sent in a cable from Saigon disputing the numbers that Sam Adams had come up with, which the numbers were between 500 and 600,000 troops, that is, armed communists in South Vietnam. General Westmoreland said, no, no, it can't be more than 299,000. Yeah. 299,000 sound a little fishy to you? That, that was the, the ceiling. Uh, you couldn't go higher than that. Abrams sent in a, 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 a very sensitive cable on the 22nd of August, so 50 years and one month ago, and it said this, quote, we can't possibly go with the higher numbers because we have been projecting an image of success in this war, and there's nothing that we could do despite all the caveats that we could adduce to avoid the press from drawing an erroneous and gloomy conclusion. 1967, just a couple months before Tet, just a couple months before all hell broke loose, Sam to his dying day regretted that he didn't go down to the New York Times Bureau in, in Washington, and so do I regret that. You see, you have to, I mean, I see puzzled faces here. You have to know that in those days, the New York Times was an independent newspaper, and actually, if you gave them some, some documentary evidence, they would put it on the front page. It was really quite remarkable. Most young, <laughs> most young people don't know that. This is a treasure trove. It's called Vault 7. And I'll just mention one thing that didn't make to the New York Times, and that is, it, it, it includes something called marble, marble framework. Now, this is a, a cyber offensive tool that allows the CIA to hack into a network or server or a computer, and the word is obfuscate, 35 cent word in CIA obfuscate who hacked in, and then leave little traces in foreign languages, like, uh, oh, they worked in five, uh, Chinese, Arabic, Farsi, Korean, and, oh yeah, Russian. <laughs> now think about that, guys. See if you can connect some dots here, you know, because nobody else is connecting those dots. If you remember back to our great Abraham Lincoln, the, one of the first things he did was round up the editors a couple hundred editors were imprisoned for criticizing the war. And, you know, Todd will talk a little more about this, but the truth is, they, and it goes back to Vietnam Syndrome, if anybody's watching, if anybody's watching the Burns Novick uh, documentary right now, you will know that this, this big effort to mislead the public so that you can keep public opinion uh, pushing for more war in order to win it. And this was a huge thing, not only during Vietnam, but afterwards. You had all kinds of suppression of, of First Amendment, even to the point of shooting people in protests, etc. Right now, the current situation is really, really, really bad. The, the First Amendment, I taught the First Amendment to the FBI, I taught ethics and the law, and after the church committee, and after that lull between Vietnam and the current wars, I was at, in the FBI. We were mandated to start our legal lectures with the First Amendment rights because of the church committee. Um, actually, I, I didn't take it real seriously because I didn't really appreciate it as much as I do now. But the First Amendment's being throttled. In the United States, they are uh, passing laws in at least 25 states so far, and then national law to shut down the boycott, divestment, and sanctions. That is, our ACLU will tell you, that is a First Amendment issue. And then the, the second thing that's going on is, of course, labeling WikiLeaks, and WikiLeaks, it will not end with WikiLeaks because they're labeled, uh, Pompeo, the CIA director, has labeled it as a hostile non-state actor. The reason for that really cool wordsmithing is that because you want to stop publishing the truth about war, that's what this is about, publishing the truth, you can't say that, you can't say that, so you have to, you have to call uh, you know, any, any entity that you don't like there are good journalists out there. Uh, of course, Cy Hirsch is one, but there are some left. 
and, and they have to be able to get the truth out through sources, because guess what integrity and intelligence involves? 80% of the work that people in the CIA, the analysts do, guess what, where they get it from? They get it from reading newspapers. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Murray out there who spoke earlier, she can, she can understand three or four languages. And so she can get, you know, intelligent by reading public sources. If we shut down the First Amendment, we won't even have the public sources, even for people in government to themselves learn things. So actually, I'd say the First Amendment is already dead. It's uh, only there in appearance and at the discretion of the Commander-in-Chief. How do I know that? Because the Department of Justice told Chris Hedges, Dan Ellsberg, Noam Chomsky, and a few others in a court case called Hedges v. Obama that that was a case, that the Commander-in-Chief, our current term for what we used to refer to gen generally as a president, uh, has such war powers that if uh, that person deems somebody to be an enemy, uh, they can have them put in a military detention now without any uh, review, all at the arbitrary discretion of that commander in chief. And uh, whether or not there's any legal process to get that person out, at best it would probably take at least 10 years, if that would even happen. Uh, that's based upon Section 1021 of the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act. That's not codified as a statute. It goes into what's called public law and remains on the books and available for, for application. Uh, just last week in the Senate, a uh, number of senators tried to repeal that provision, or at least to make it not applicable to U.S. citizens, which confirms that in fact is applicable to U.S. citizens. And uh, that effort failed. So it's still there. U.S. citizens can be put in to military detention at the sole discretion of the Commander-in-Chief, whom we call the President. That's Donald Trump today. So I, I like to point out to people that who was the actual sounder, greater military strategist in the 60s and, and uh, 50s and 60s? I would say it was Pete Seeger <laughs> rather, than, rather than Westmoreland and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and people like McMaster, who comes along 20 years later and said, yeah, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they only aired because they should have sent the 200,000 troops that Westmoreland asked for. And now Westmoreland, or rather McMaster, is held up by an ignorant journalistic class that thinks he's actually going to provide adult leadership to Donald Trump? I mean, how much more incredible can we get here in America?